Sweet Salo for Lover, this is Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific. I'm Susanna Suiswiki. Coming up, there's mixed reactions towards France's new Prime Minister. Also, they stood up for what was right. We are all oppressed indigenous peoples, and now's the time to fight back. Dawn raids, the play reaches its 30th year. And later on, just being part of the games also helps us reunite once again. Excitement is building up for the Cook Islands Games. There's been mixed reactions to France's Prime Minister's handling of the crisis in New Caledonia. Mitchell Barnier made a lengthy policy announcement earlier this week, which included plans to scrap a highly sensitive electoral reform proposed for the Pacific Territory and the postponement of local elections. From New Caledonia pro-independence groups, there's been a guarded positive response, but the sentiment among loyalists is more akin with somehow being let down by the new government. Koroi Hawkins asked Patrick de Kloyter on our French Pacific desk what exactly the Prime Minister said about New Caledonia in his policy announcement. About two minutes um, dedicated to New Caledonia during the French Prime Minister's uh, national policy announcement. And one uh, of the main uh, items was that uh, the controversial uh, constitutional bill to change electoral rules uh, uh, for New Caledonia's provincial elections uh, will actually not go ahead now. Earlier, uh, Macron had said that uh, the uh, project uh, was uh, on hold, suspended, but he never said actually that it would be completely abandoned. Now, for the first time, it is uh, official that uh, the constitutional bill will not be tabled at the French Congress. Of course, uh, in Corollary to that is the postponement of provincial elections that were supposed to take place before the end of this year. There was also the announcement that uh, a delegation headed by the Senate and National Assembly presidents, Gérard Larcher and uh, Yael braun pivet were going to travel there soon to resume political talks for New Caledonia. And also that uh, for the sake of uh, continuity, they were going to be backed by high officials from the PM's office and the French office's ministry. Also in the announcements made by uh, Barnier was uh, that the French president, Macron, was still planning to get everyone from New Caledonia's political spectrum around a table in Paris sometime in uh, November. Have there been any reactions given to the Prime Minister's speech so far? It's very mixed. There are the people who were part of a bipartisan delegation currently in Paris who are mostly talking about hope. They seem to be satisfied by the dumping of that constitutional amendment because they said that was probably the only stumbling block that was um, preventing a proper resumption of political talks for the future of New Caledonia. But you have to bear in mind that uh, in that uh, congressional delegation of New Caledonia in Paris, the pro-France loyalists withdrew from that delegation at the last minute last week, which brings us to the pro-French reactions. That includes uh, Southern Province uh, President Sonia Baquez, uh, who was a staunch supporter of that electoral reform and who says that this uh, scrapping of the electoral reform was actually useless because this decision was made only to please the pro-independence uh, extremists, as she calls them, to hope that uh, the talks would finally resume. On the same uh, camp, Nicolas Metzdorf, who is uh, also the French uh, member of National Assembly in New Caledonia, actually left before the speech ended, and he said he was not very impressed because the economical uh, aspect of New Caledonia's situation had not been uh, properly addressed in that speech. Given how narrow the margins in the French National Assembly are after the snap election, do you think Barnier will last long? Well, Coroy uh, is uh, only relying on a very small majority because of the alliances that have been made. But uh, the reality is that the French National Assembly at the moment is uh, very divided. Not one single party has uh, an absolute majority. 
far from it. We've seen during this speech, uh, the atmosphere was very telling. There was booze from the left wing, uh, La France Insoumise, because uh, they were trying to show that uh, the French prime minister was not legitimate and that a left wing prime minister should have been appointed. There are talks already of a motion of no confidence. That's just to tell a little bit about the atmosphere. Now it depends on the, how the support will go on. There is also on the right side of the house the Rassemblement National from Marine Le Pen. She said that so far the Prime Minister can rely on their support, but if uh, it comes to a stage where uh, what he's doing does not please them, then they would uh, probably withdraw their support as well. So in a nutshell now, we've got a French prime minister, a minister of overseas territories who's directly attached to the French prime minister, and even the French president, who are saying at different times that they are personally involved in New Caledonia's affairs. Celebrating its 30th year, theatre group Pacific Underground will showcase its widely acclaimed production of Dawn Raids to the Wellington Opera House this month. The play revisits a shameful period in the 1970s where the New Zealand government cracked down on overstayers, removing Pacific families out of their homes in a series of targeted early morning police raids. Infused with Pacifica humour and heart, the play aims to enlighten as well as educate. I caught up with the producer of Pacific Underground, Tanya Muangututsia, and started off by asking her what's taken them so long to bring the play to Wellington. Oh, that's a good question, Susanna. Um, well, actually, it's the play is actually, so it was written in 2000, and, sorry, no, the play by Oscar Kitely was written in 1997. So the play itself is, um, you know, 20 six whatever years that makes it um 27 years the company pacific underground we're like just over 30 years old um we first put that production on in auckland and wellington i mean sorry auckland and christchurch sorry um and we've always wanted to um come to wellington we're so we're so stoked to be coming to wellington finally especially with this play and what's taken it so long is that we as a company in the um late 90s sort of stopped putting on major plays, you know, for a little while there. Um, and we diversified our company. We did events and we did, um, we've, you know, we've done lots of performing arts concerts and shows and things like that. And then, um, yeah, we've just been in this wonderful um, time, time in our history. The last five years, we've been involved in two revivals of our early work. And including Dawn Raid. So two years ago, we were able to bring the play back in um, Auckland um, with a brand new generation. So that version is coming to Wellington. We're really proud. We're really proud of that. We're part of the CNZ New Dawn Raids Initiative, which um, we were able to apply for funding to to be able to bring, you know, and we at the time when we did it in Auckland, we, you know, it was a massive big production bringing that back we we're really proud to bring it back at the time just after the apology it was all the timing was great um but also you know it was sort of like a one in a lifetime we, it just felt like it was you know a beautiful way to bring such a powerful piece back into um our lives and and bring a new generation to it so being able to put it up again and and our first of course our first point of call is go to wellington you know after all these years um we were just so excited. We can't wait. We can't wait to be there. Just staying on that subject, um, you know, having the play in Wellington, would you say that this decision to have it there was politically motivated, you know, given the current government's position on equity-based initiatives? Yeah, in part, for sure. I mean, you know, we're back in my day when, uh, <laughs> when I started working in theatre, Wellington was the place to go. And we feel that artistically, you know, as the artistic capital, and as a, you know, as a young Pacific company coming out of Christchurch, you know, that's always been, it was always a goal anyway to be in Wellington. And now, of course, yes, it, it's it's vital to be in Wellington because it's the centre of, you know, where all our politics is, where all our, you know, our, our politicians are. And, and, you know, we've invited the, our, you know, the, 
people to come, the po you know politicians to come, the important ones that we feel that um, are associated with our work. But also, you know, it's a it's definitely a time for us to be able to say to Parliament, we're on your doorstep. Please come. See our story, it's an important story. It's, you know, it represents our people. Um, and it was written at a time when, um, you know, Oscar was, you know, had this amazing foresight, which is what he's well known for, his intelligence and his foresight to tell a story that nobody wanted to talk about at the time that it was written. So, you know, we've, we're really blessed to be able to keep sharing the story and it's, it should be shared. It's a new generation that are presenting the story. We've just been able to bring a Wellington actor into our fold for this one because it's the same version. You know, we've got the same show that we put on in Auckland, which was um, Auckland and Christchurch actors. And now, you know, we're bringing it to Wellington with, an, uh, with a Wellington actor. So we're really happy with that. And some ensemble people will be from Wellington. But also we have Pacific Underground members who are based in Wellington as well. So, you know, we're just happy to, to come. We're definitely happy to come there, yeah. So just changing tack slightly here, enough of the politics. Um, you mentioned that there's a new generation involved in this production. So who are the up and coming stars? Oh, who's in the show? Okay, so we're our, um, it is an ensemble cast. Everyone shines in this one. We have our moment, but we do have a main character, Sione, um, who's played by Mikey Valiasiu, who's, who's part, he's part of, um, he was part of Red, White and Brass. He was in the movie and also in the theatre production of that. Um, and then he, his character, Sione, has parents, uh, Toanga and Mose. Um, Toanga is played by Bella Kalolo, who's a short and street star. Actually, she did this project before she landed the Shorty Street role. So it's so great for her to come back because she's busier. Um, and also ex-Wellington resident. Uh, and then um, Lawie um, Tofa is, is um who's known as Ben from the ASB ads <laughs> is plays Morsi. Um and then we have Tali Ray Marvanga who plays um the sister of the main character, Teresa, um Jake Tupu, uh and then a lovely um for Rosa is played by the lovely Sina Isera, who is from Wellington. Yeah, she's just like basically just got cast couple of days ago <laughs> so this is like you heard it here first um yeah so yeah we're glad to be able to reach out to you know some some of our wellington Ainga who are our performing arts family but also our family you know who um who've been helping us out so yeah we're really we're really stoked earlier you mentioned that the story or history rather that it needs to be told um but i'm just wondering how does this play offer healing if it's revisiting traumatic moments yeah you sh yeah you're you're right it does revisit that it revisits it for those of my generation and, and older who some have lived through the trauma but you know the new generation who are putting it on uh the ones who are really pushing this agenda and the ones who are really taking in the story and moving it forward um, and wanting, you know, wanting our, wanting everybody to know. Um, we're still getting people and comments on Facebook, you know, of, you know, people just, uh, what, what is the Dawn Rats? What is, what is this? People still don't know, you know, even though there was this national apology that we were so, that was so greatly received and and we're very you know humbled and grateful for that but this is a story of the ages right that needs to be told it's part of Aotearoa's history and so yeah you know we um it is traumatic and it does um you know the play itself it is from the perspective of a family it's inside the family you know we are seeing their reactions and there are multiple uh reactions towards the the dawn raids that come out in this family and that's the brilliant writing of oscar so we do see a wide scope of opinions and and um you know situations that come out of this story and just to wrap up bell talanoa what else are you hoping audiences of today will take away from this play it's this is a part of you know a significant part of our history of aotearoa's history not just specific people but everybody um learning understanding you know this there's so many you know, there's so many lessons to be learned from the past, but also, you know, our people have gone through so much in this, 
in this nation and we've contributed so beautifully towards you know where we are now you know like we've when we first started telling this story there weren't that many of pacific people that we we could aspire to that were in entertainment or arts or te television and movies but look where we've come you know we've not not that it's just all about the arts but it's also about the sports and any other you know sciences all of that stuff you know we're really good at uplifting our people but we also need our role models and so you know for us to be able to tell the story and our new generation to grasp the story and to share it out that's where we come from you know where we come from is pu supporting our people pushing them forward pushing, you know pushing our young ones forward to be able to you know keep telling the stories and they feel really uplifted by that and then if they can uplift our communities because of that then we're doing our, the right thing we're doing the right job so yeah that's why it's so important and uh yeah as I said, we, I, I can't wait to come to Wellington and I must say, I think I've left one of our cast members out, which is Italia Hunt. So yeah, <laughs> so, sorry about that, Italia. But yeah, you know, like, so this is a um, wonderful time to bring this, this, yeah, this story forward for our new generation. The, the show itself is, it is, um, it visits all of the range of um, emotions and feelings when it comes to the Dawn Raids. It has a live band as well. Uh, you know, so there's beautiful music. So yeah, we're just really stoked to be able to bring it to Wellington. Yay! With just three days to go until the opening of the Cook Islands Games, the island of Rarotonga is abuzz with excitement. From lawn bowls, rugby and athletics, through to traditional stilt races and speed coconut husking, the games highlight the talents of local athletes across all sporting codes. Tiana Haxton is in the Cook Islands and filed this report. Over 3,000 athletes representing 11 teams will be participating in the third Cook Island Games, which kicks off this weekend. The 11 teams represent a majority of the inhabited islands of the Cook Islands. The domestic airport was a sea of yellow this morning as athletes from the island of Aitutaki arrived ahead of the Games. Team Vice President Atingata Diriu said over 200 athletes have travelled from Aitutaki to represent their island with pride. This is the largest team that we've assembled and the Games provide unique chance for our athletes to connect with others compete of their best and represent our island with pride. We are also looking forward to a sense of unity and community that comes with these games. An athlete from Team Mauke says while the event is highly competitive, it brings the community together. The Mauke Island team were the overall winners of the first edition of the Cook Island Games in 2020. Badminton player Nicolia Materiki says while they aspire to bring the trophy home once again, she is mainly looking forward to reconnecting with her family and friends travelling from the outer islands to compete. Due to our busy everyday lives with our jobs, just being part of the games also helps us reunite once again. I mean, it also helps getting to know who else is from your island and who else may be from your same family or bloodline and showing each other's friendly side and also competitive side when we are on the field. An experienced lawn bowls player sees the games are inclusive of all ages. With juniors as young as 11 years old and golden oldies in their 80s, William Powell says while the older ones are supportive of the newer players, it makes for great competition in the mixed divisions. Representing Palmerston Island in the lawn bowls triples, Powell enjoys seeing young and old competing side by side. For our games, I always joke that I'm the youngest one and I'm 72. It's, it's very good uh, to have uh, all different uh, game people because a lot of the young ones try to beat the old ones and the old ones don't want the young ones to beat them at all. So good competition. The grand opening of the Cook Islands Games will be on the 4th of October, starting with a colourful parade of the islands competing for this year's trophy. The Games are held every two years after being introduced in 2020. That's Pacific Waves for today. For more episodes, head over to rnz.co.nz forward slash Pacific. We're also on Spotify, Apple and iHeartRadio. From myself and the RNZ Pacific team, to far sui